Casas Alvero conjecture. If an integer k can be expressed as the product of two integers m and n, then m and n are called factors of k. A common factor of two integers is a factor shared by two integers. For instance, 4 and 6 have a common factor of 2. Similarly, if a polynomial f can be expressed as the product of two polynomials g and h, then g and h are called factors of f. The polynomials x squared plus x and 2x plus 2 have a common factor of x plus 1, since they can respectively be expressed as x times quantity x plus 1 and 2 times quantity x plus 1, where x, 2, and x plus 1 are each polynomials of their own. Now, consider the single variable polynomial function f of x equals x cubed plus 3x squared plus 3x plus 1. This can actually be expressed as the third power of a polynomial of degree 1. f of x equals quantity x plus 1 cubed. A polynomial of degree 1 is called a linear polynomial. Some might call this a fine instead, but this is just a difference in terminology. Let's take the derivative of our function. This can be factored into 3 times quantity x plus 1 squared, showing that it shares a common factor of x plus 1 with f of x. Now take the second derivative of the original function. This factors into 6 times quantity x plus 1, again sharing a common factor with f of x. Alternatively, you could have simply left the original function expressed as f of x equals quantity x plus 1 cubed, and taken derivatives using the power and chain rule, which would have easily yielded the same result. Now the original function was of degree 3, and we've taken derivatives up to the second order, which is 1 less than 3. Therefore, we can stop here. As we have seen, both of the derivatives share a common factor with the original function, and the original function can be expressed as a power of a linear polynomial. The Casas Alvero conjecture, proposed by Spanish mathematician Eduardo Casas Alvero in 2001, is the hypothesis that whenever a polynomial f of degree d shares a common factor with all of its derivatives up to order d minus 1, that means f must be a power of a linear polynomial. The polynomials do not necessarily have to represent real numbers. They can represent the elements of any field of characteristic zero, of which the real numbers are an example. Riemann hypothesis. Take the sum 1 over 1 to the s power plus 1 over 2 to the s power plus 1 over 3 to the s power, and so on toward infinity, where s is a complex number. An infinite sum like this is called a series. If the real part of s, the a in a plus bi, is greater than 1, then this series converges, meaning that adding more and more terms makes it approach a specific finite value. We define the series to be equal to that value. This series is how the Riemann zeta function, named after German mathematician Bernard Riemann, is defined for complex numbers with real part greater than 1. On the rest of the complex plane, the Riemann zeta function is defined by filling in the gaps in a way where the function always has a derivative at every point where it's defined. The complex derivative is defined similarly to the real derivative, just with everything being complex numbers. Anyway, this method of extending a function is called analytic continuation. Using the portion we already have, there is exactly one way to do this. So we are locked into one specific definition for the function even if the definition is very implicit. This defines the function for every complex number except s equals 1. Despite the relatively simple definition of this function, much remains unknown about it. In particular, one conjecture, math term for guess, concerns the function's zeros, the inputs where the function outputs a value of zero. Every negative even integer falls into this category, being called a trivial zero. Besides that, we know all other zeros have real parts between 0 and 1, occupying a region of the complex plane called the critical strip. The complex numbers with real part 1 over 2 compose a line called the critical line. Riemann conjectured that all non-trivial zeros of the zeta function have real part 1 over 2, lying on the critical line. Indeed, this is true of every non-trivial zero we've found so far. This conjecture is known as the Riemann hypothesis, and proving or disproving it would have big implications in many areas of math. 
but no one has managed. It is the sixth of the Millennium Prize problems, a set of problems with million dollar prizes attached. Navier Stokes' Existence and Smoothness. Consider the equation f prime of x equals f of x. This states that the function f is its own derivative. An equation relating a function and its derivatives like this is called a differential equation. A differential equation can be solved. Instead of solving for a specific value, we are solving for the function f. Here, the solution is f of x equals c times Euler's number to the x power, for some constant c, as that captures every possible defined everywhere function, which is its own derivative. Since the equation uses a single variable function, it is called an ordinary differential equation, or ODE. In contrast, multivariable calculus sees the use of multivariable functions, like f of xy equals x squared plus xy plus y. You plug in two numbers x and y, and the expression on the right gives you a number in return. This concept gives rise to the partial derivative, a derivative with respect to one variable that treats the other variables as constant. For this function, those are as shown. An equation relating the partial derivatives of a multivariable function is called a partial differential equation, or PDE. The Navier-Stokes equations are PDEs that characterize how viscous fluids move. They are named after Claude-Louis Navier and Georges-Gabriel Stokes. The former a French engineer, the latter an Irish mathematician, both physicists. The Navier-Stokes existence and smoothness problem, which is the fourth millennium prize problem, asks the following. Suppose you have an initial velocity field in 3D space determining which way and how fast the particles in a fluid flow at the starting time. You need to prove that you can provide a vector velocity and a scalar pressure field, both smooth and defined everywhere, that solve the Navier-Stokes equations. Or you need to provide an example of a case where this is impossible. The Navier-Stokes equations are a promising lead in terms of the concept of turbulence. Anyone who's taken enough plane rides is probably familiar with turbulence. It's when a fluid, as in a liquid or gas, rapidly undergoes chaotic changes but it is one of physics biggest unsolved problems. Physicists believe that if we can understand the Navier-Stokes equations better, we will be able to understand turbulence better as a result. Jacobian conjecture. In multivariable calculus, a function can take in a vector and give you a vector in response. For instance, you can have the function f of xy equals 2y 3x. Evaluating this function on the vector 1, 2, you get f12 equals 2 times 2, 3 times 1, equals 4, 3. So the vector 1, 2 gets mapped to 4, 3. Here, the first part of the output, f1 equals 2y, is called the function's first component, and the second part, f2 equals 3x, is called the second component. When you have a function like this, you can construct its Jacobian matrix. This is a matrix full of each of the partial derivatives of each of the components of f. In our case, with two input variables and two output components, we can evaluate it like so. Since our input and output have the same number of dimensions, the matrix we get is a square matrix. This means that we can take its determinant, called the Jacobian determinant, denoted Jf. The formula for the determinant of a 2x2 two two matrix is shown here which we can apply to our matrix. The Jacobian matrix and determinant are named after German mathematician Carl Gustav Jacob Jacobi. They allow us to apply linear algebra concepts to transformations of space that look locally linear in a small neighborhood of each point. The other concept needed is that of a field, which is a set equipped with the normal arithmetic operations, with similar behavior as in the real numbers. A field has an additive identity and a multiplicative identity. Adding the additive identity doesn't change an element, nor does multiplying by the multiplicative identity. These are 0 and 1 in the real numbers, respectively. If the additive identity can't be obtained by adding together a positive number of copies of the multiplicative identity, the field is said to have characteristic 0. You can't add a positive number of 1s to get 0. So, the real numbers have characteristic 0. Now. Let k be a field of characteristic 0, and let f be a function from k to the power of n to itself. For fixed integer, 
n greater than 1. For example, k could be the real numbers, and n could be 2. Then, f would map from r squared to itself, where r squared is the usual 2d vector space. If jf is some constant non-zero value, then f has an inverse function g with polynomial components. To use our earlier example with our function f, we found that the Jacobian determinant of our function was negative 6, which is indeed a constant, and also not 0. Can we find an inverse, g, that maps the output back to the input? That involves solving this equation. Yielding this definition of g, both 1 3rd y and 1 half x are indeed polynomials, so g does have polynomial components. If you can either prove or disprove that this will always happen, you will have solved the Jacobian conjecture.